In the last video, we noticed that if you take a discrete distribution and you increase your sample size, your n value, your curve becomes, well, your distribution becomes more and more continuous. The bars become narrower and narrower. Every one probability becomes smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it basically becomes zero, which is what happens when the curve actually is continuous, which we noticed right here. Now we want to take those same ideas and apply it to a binomial distribution. So James Bernoulli, who is the inventor of the binomial distribution, and Abraham de Moivre started studying the binomial distributions at length, and they noticed something. So when you've seen these graphs before, if you have a binomial distribution here with n equal to 15 and the probability of success is 0.5, it looks like that. And then if you let n be 70, look what's happening. Right? It's, it was symmetric, it was nice, but as you let n increase and get larger and larger, the curve turns more and more towards this classic bell-shaped curve that we know and love. Carl Pearson would later coin the term normal for this curve. He called it the normal curve. And it is an extremely important curve to us. We are going to be using it a lot from this point on to the rest of the end of the course. Very, very important. All right, so what is the normal probability distribution? It's continuous randomly, random variable is normally distributed if its relative frequency histogram has the shape of a normal curve. And the normal curve is this function right here. No, I'm not kidding. That's an actual function. You could type it up and graph it. It would make the classic normal curve shape that you know and love. But of course, I'm not going to make you actually work with that function. We're just going to, well, we are going to work with it, but not in function form. We're not in an algebra or calculus class. So let's think about what we know about a normal curve already, since we've already seen the normal curve in chapter three. And in case you've forgotten it, I have a lovely picture lower down on this page. Now, first of all, this graph is symmetric. That's a first thing to notice. That means that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are perfect mirror images of each other across that middle line in the middle where mu is, and we all know mu is the center of the curve. So it's symmetric about the center at mu. Oh, hold on, let me insert that symbol. There, it's about um, center, symmetric about the center Oh, here. I don't know why I did that. It's centered about the mean mu. There we go. Symmetric about the mean mu, or on either side of the mean. Now, the center of the curve depends entirely on blank, where the graph has the highest single peak occurs. Well, again, that would be the mean mu, because where the mean is, that's where the center of your curve is. That's your highest peak. Now, the graph has inflection points at the mean minus the standard deviation and the mean plus the standard deviation. So the inflection points happen, they're at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma. And then inflection points, remember that is where the graph is the steepest, where the graph changes from being concave down to concave up. So let me type all that up one second. There we go. The inflection points are where the graph shifts from being concave down to concave up, and that's where the curve is its steepest. They will always be where one standard deviation falls on either side of the mean. Right? Because you have a standard deviation on the left and a standard deviation on the right, they will be exactly the same distance. So if your standard deviation is 10, that's where it falls. 10 to the right, 10 to the left. Now the shape of the curve depends entirely on sigma. Now sigma is your standard deviation, your population standard deviation. So if you have a smaller sigma value that gives you a narrower graph, and a larger sigma means you'll have a wider graph. Okay. The total area under the entire curve, of course, is one because this is a probability distribution. Ah, if I could spell the word distribution, right? There we go. All right, now the area under the curve to the right and the area under the curve to the left. Oh, okay. So if the whole curve makes one and mu is in the middle, then the area on the left and the area on the right both have to be half, 0.5, right? Because the whole curve makes one and it's symmetric. And last but not least, the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. 
Now, horizontal asymptote is something you learn about in algebra class. It means that the curve kind of surfs along the x-axis, but it never actually touches it. And that horizontal line on the bottom, that's important. That's the x-axis, so you have to draw it in there. The vertical axis you don't really need, but the horizontal axis you definitely do need. All right, so let me type that up one second. There we go. The curve gets closer and closer to, to, to zero, which would be where the x-axis is, in both of the tails, but it never reaches zero, i.e. the x-axis. You can think of it as kind of surfing along the axis, right? It surfs along the axis. Be very Hawaiian about it. All right, so now we have the normal probability curve all figured out. Lovely. You will need to draw the horizontal axis. You don't necessarily draw the vertical axis. You don't need it. But you do need the horizontal axis when you draw it. All right, so let's look at these curves right here. And we want to figure out what the mean is and what the standard deviation is for each of these curves. So let's take a look. Now remember the mean is where the center is, and the standard deviation is where the inflection point happens. So if you look at the gray curve, that's curve number one, its mean is at zero. And curve number two, its mean is at three. Okay, so let me type that up. So curve number one had a mean of zero, approximately. And curve number two had a mean of three. Great. Okay, what about standard deviations? Well, the standard deviations where a, the inflection point happens, which is about one away for both of these. So standard deviation is one for curve number one. It's actually one for curve number two as well. And there we have it. Now, why do they have the same standard deviation? We can see they actually have an identical shape. The shape is what is determined by the standard deviation. So when they have the same shape like this, that means their standard deviations are the same. What's different about the two curves is their center. The center on the gray curve is at zero. The center on the dashed curve is around three. So their sh centers are shifted apart from each other, but their standard deviations are not. They are the identical because they have the same lovely shape. Now let's look at part B here. Okay, well, these two curves have the same center because they both have a peak at zero, but they have very different shapes. So both curves are going to have centers at zero, but curve one, oops, I should have labeled it. Sorry about that. Curve one is the gray curve. Let me fix that. There we go. Now I have them labeled. So again, curve one is the gray one and curve two is the dash one, just like the one, the problem above. They both have a mean of zero. Now curve one looks like the inflection point's happening right about where my cursor is. So that's about two. So and again, how am I eyeballing that? Well, it's an art, but really what you're doing is you're looking for where up here at the top of the peak, it's kind of bowl shaped down, concave down. And over here at the tails, it's concave up. So somewhere in the middle, it switches. And it's usually about, if you think of the bottom of the curve is at zero and the top of the curve is at point, point 0.20, it's a little bit above the point 0.10 mark. So point 0.10 is kind of right there. It's up a little bit above that. So that's about two. If you look at the x-axis, about two. Now, the black dashed curve, let's see here. So there's concave up. About halfway will be right there, so it's going to be a little bit higher than halfway. So you take the top of the curves at point 0.1, the bottom of the curve at 0. 0 0.05 would be halfway. You want to go a little bit above that, so it looks like it's about 4 for this one. So I'm going to make a standard deviation of about 4. Notice it's a bigger number. That's why it's a wider curve. See how the dashed curve is wider than the skinny narrow curve. That's getting back to what I was saying back here. Oopsie. Come back. That the larger your standard deviation, the wider your curve. The smaller your standard deviation, the narrower your curve. Right? All right, now you're going to be drawing a lot of these by hand. So when you draw them by hand, you want to pay attention to several things. One, you want to draw a graph that is symmetric around your mean. Make sure it's a symmetric graph. Make sure it looks like a normal curve. Number two, you want to make sure you have a horizontal asymptote at your x-axis. Don't have the curve 
cross over the x-axis. It has to kind of surf along it and disappear. One, your first standard deviation falls at your inflection points. When you put down your standard deviation, make sure it happens just a little bit above halfway from the top of the curve to the bottom of the curve. That'll be your standard deviation. Don't make the standard deviation too skinny or too fat and keep it consistent. Keep your vertical lines and your spacing, the tick marks, consistent. Otherwise, you will be in big trouble. It has to be that that number, standard deviation number, is consistent throughout the entire curve. All right, we're going to pause right there, and I'm going to do the next problem in the next video. So I'll see you back here then.